Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. The topic this time will be entirety. I use the word in a couple of ways. First, to refer to the entirety of the Mindful Biology program, which I've been working on for 10 years now. Early on, the focus was using anatomical and physiological knowledge to feel more sensitively into our bodily interior in the practice of mindfulness. At other times, we've looked at biological information in order to help dissolve our sense of separation from the natural world and one another. We've also used biology to understand the difficult aspects of life, such as pain and illness, aging and mortality, from a broader and kinder perspective. All of these taken together constitute what I call mindful biology. And there's this additional element that is always present, which is seeking the sacred in life at all times holding the living world with love and our bodies likewise. I see these as four important elements in our relationship with the entirety of the world and of the universe, which brings in the second use of the word. We could say these are the elements of our relationship with reality. We may not often think in terms of having a relationship with reality, but there are many signs that we actually do. If we look at how we experience our human bodies, for instance, we know that we talk about them almost as if they were possessions. I talk about my hand, my face, and so on. So this is a relationship of ownership of course, if you follow mindful biology for any length of time, you realize that ownership is not my preferred language to talk about the body, but it comes up so automatically that we need to address it. And right now, the main point is that it establishes a kind of relationship between what I call myself and what I call my body. This relational quality comes up all the time. We have relationships, of course, with one another and with uh, animals, but we also form relationships with possessions like our homes, with tools, even with idea systems. We can have a friendly relationship, a conflicted relationship, and so on. We relate to everything because we are relational beings. And so when we look out upon the cosmos and out upon the earth, we're going to do so from a relational stance. When I first began exploring the idea of mindful biology, my emphasis was on trying to bring together two ways of relating with reality, one being the scientific with an emphasis on objective empirical findings, and the other being a spiritual approach with much more emphasis on subjective experience and inner life. I felt that science could use a big dose of the sacred and many spiritual traditions could use a nice helping of empirical grounding. I still believe all that, but I no longer see this part of the project as primary because it is, after all, quite conceptual to talk about science and even to talk about the ultimate nature of reality, what's behind it all. And while conversations like that can be fun and sometimes contentious, they can really engage us. Where we live is in relationship. And even when we feel passionately about our scientific or spiritual beliefs, it's because of some relationship we have with them or what they represent. It's this felt quality of relating to something other than the self, which determines a lot of our experience in the world, at least in terms of whether we're satisfied and contented in life or 
feeling dissatisfied and anguished. I encourage you to pause the video at this point and allow this to sink in for a few moments. Take some deep breaths, feel into your body, into your chest cavity and belly, and then restart the video after you've taken a moment. So we'll be talking in this session about relating to reality. I've already addressed the issue of relationship, but what about reality? Clearly that's a vast topic because it means literally everything. So how am I going to address it in a short little series like this? There are lots of possibilities, but one that I've chosen is to use the ancient four element system of earth, water, air, and fire. Variants on these four elements occur in many venerable traditions, including the ones symbolized on the right. Often it's looked at as being rather primitive and pre-scientific by those who have more modern understanding of the natural world. But in fact, science has its own form of a four element system closely aligned with earth, water, air, and fire. And that is the system that describes the available states or phases in which matter can exist. It can be a solid, a liquid, a gas, or a plasma. No doubt we're all very familiar with solids, liquids, and gases. We may be less familiar with plasma. It usually is found in high energy situations. And when we get to it in our final talk of this series, we'll be looking at its relationship to energy. So to preview where we're going after today's talk, we'll look at how we relate to the earth or to solidity relating to water or liquidity, how we relate to air or the gaseous environment and how we relate to fire or plasma or energy. So we're building up a system here of looking at reality in terms of its component features. I'm using the globe as a stand in for reality at large, because after all, most of the reality we experience is in fact on the surface of our planet. So we'll be looking at reality and its components through these relational lenses. To give an example of how relationship is important, I want to tell a little story from my own life. We've all had a lot of experience with reality and life on Earth, and we've all had many ups and downs in the course of that. In my case, I had a very low period when I was 41. My life went into a kind of spiral of difficulty. I had serious neck arthritis, which was causing considerable pain, and that, unfortunately, was interfering with my ability to perform my work as a surgeon. Ultimately, I went out on disability, and I also had some other major setbacks around that time. The effect of all that was to make my relationship with reality quite rocky. I felt that the earth was a punishing and grinding place and I didn't want to be here anymore. I began to contemplate suicide and then caught myself and checked into a psychiatric hospital for safety. I spent a couple of weeks there and was discharged, not feeling a whole lot better. But shortly after leaving the hospital, something remarkable occurred. My moods surged in the opposite direction and I experienced a prolonged time of ecstasy during which the world and the universe felt like a seamless whole, permeated with love and utterly beautiful. When I was in that state of mind, of course, my relationship with reality was much improved. Now I must say the psychiatrists around me had other language to describe what I was going through, but from my side, these were profound religious visionary experiences. 
as I look back on that time, it's remarkable how dramatically my relationship with reality changed, given that my material circumstances hadn't improved at all and indeed were continuing to worsen. It really highlights for me how the world can look very different depending on how we relate with it. Early on, I thought that the difference lay in whether I took a spiritualist or a materialist stance. I had been raised as an atheist. My father was a physics professor and a Marxist, and he had little interest in or respect for religion, and I grew up with those viewpoints. My scientific education only deepened them. But after my experiences of ecstasy, I started to look at the world as having a loving intelligence behind it, and I began to worship that intelligence. In fact, I'd been on a spiritual path for about 12 years already. I had started going to Quaker meetings when I joined 12-step programs. And my ancestry was Quaker, and I respected the Quaker tradition, but there are many atheists within Quakerism, and I was one of them. I didn't really have a deep belief system, but I could see the value of having a spiritual community and attending to my value system. Well, that spirituality got a big boost when I had my ecstatic experiences. Now, the period of elevation lasted quite a long time, but it didn't last forever, and I eventually drifted back into a state of more confusion and uncertainty. And I started to think about my atheist position that had been so habitual for me. And I remembered what Sigmund Freud had suggested, that when people believe in something like a large intelligence that loves them, that they're actually recreating some childhood or toddlerhood memory of having a great big loving parent, uh, you know, towering above them and reaching down with arms outstretched, something like that. This actually seemed like a fairly convincing argument. And although my experiences felt a lot more powerful than anything like that, it was hard for me to shake the possibility that it could all be a kind of illusion based on early life experience. The atheist viewpoint that I was most familiar with takes the position that matter is without any sensation or intelligence. Uh, it's basically just hard stuff that for all sorts of reasons relating to scientific laws and the origin of the universe randomly has collected itself into uh, elaborate forms, including human bodies, and along the way intelligence developed, and here we are. But the whole thing is without any deep meaning. There's nothing that actually cares other than other humans, and we're all alone here. That's a bit of a stark uh, philosophy, but it's widely held, and I held it for a long time. But at some point, it occurred to me that it felt actually rather familiar. It reminded me of the times when I was neglected and abandoned as a child, which were actually fairly frequent. And there was that sense of loneliness and meaninglessness and not mattering and so on. And it occurred to me that that brand of atheism can be accused of the same thing that theistic religions are accused of by Freud and others. And that is, they could actually be memories of early childhood experiences projected onto the present day and the universe as a whole. That doesn't mean that I'm now convinced that it's necessary to be a spiritualist and that material views are inherently harsher, because of course there are religions that are quite harsh and punitive and, and do not take a loving stance in my opinion. And there are also atheists who present a happy and loving face to the world. Carl Sagan is a good example of someone who expounded a largely material philosophy, and yet emphasized the wonder and beauty and supportiveness of the cosmos. So it began to seem to me like our belief about what's underneath and behind reality might not be so important. 
And of course, we could carry this analysis of early childhood experience further. Those who believe in a punishing God may very well have been raised in a punishing household. And someone like Carl Sagan, who feels a lot of love and support in the universe, but doesn't ascribe it to some you know, separate intelligence, may be like a child who has been so well loved and cared for that he can play by himself without looking over his shoulder to be sure that mom and dad are watching. So the question of why I felt better after my experiences than before began to seem like it wasn't really hinging on this idea of whether I took a spiritualist or a materialist stance. Those seem to be kind of important for other reasons, but not for the reason of determining whether the world felt to me like a benevolent and supportive place or a punitive and harsh one. I began to see that we have two lenses through which we can view the world. Of course, it's you know, more complicated than this, but in the simplest terms, we have two choices. We can view the cosmos as a benevolent and supportive place or as a punitive and harsh one. I encourage you once again to pause the video at this point, take a few deep breaths, feel into the tissues of your organism, and then restart. So going back to these two possible worldviews or world relationships, we're now suggesting that they're related to early life experiences in some way. We're relating to reality to some degree at least on the basis of how we felt as infants or toddlers or young children. This is bringing us into the domain of attachment theory, which used to be a fairly obscure psychological concept that has entered the mainstream in the form of popular books, podcasts, and so on. So you probably already know that there are people who have a secure attachment style, who form loving relationships easily when they meet appropriate people and have stable bonds that are not terribly conflictual. People with secure attachment are more, much more likely to have come from loving homes where they were supported and adored and given a sense of safety and importance. Unfortunately, many people, and I include myself in this category, did not develop a secure attachment style. There are actually a few different flavors of insecure attachment. I won't go into all of them, but they derive from difficult early life experience in most cases, and they're characterized by difficulty forming stable, non-conflictual interpersonal bonds. So we have these two ways of relating with reality, and we have actually several choices of language with which to describe it. Attachment theory is one. On a more ongoing basis, we could take a biomedical or materialist perspective and talk in terms of neurochemicals and brain structures. So neurochemicals like oxytocin and endorphins and our capacity to resonate with others through mirror neurons support a happier experience, a more stable and well-attached relationship with reality. Neurochemicals such as stress hormones, epinephrine and cortisol, and brain structures that mediate difficult emotional experience like the amygdala are probably more active when we're experiencing the reality through the lens of a more conflicted relationship style with more insecure attachment elements. So that's one terminology that we could use. Another is more spiritual or religious, talking about redemption and angels and heaven on the one hand and sin and hell and punishment on the other. This sounds a little archaic to our ears these days, but some people still use this terminology and it does have at least a descriptive value. But personally, I think the most useful language to use is straightforward emotional terminology that we apply very often in our daily lives. 
And we can talk about empathy and joy on the one hand and fear and distrust and craving on the other. This terminology brings us into the realm of familiar daily experience with emotional condition. It's more understandable on a personal basis than the more abstract languages of biomedicine and religion. And so that's why I advocate this kind of terminology. The good news in all of this is that we have the capacity to alter our relationship with reality. After all, no one is completely incapable of forming loving bonds, and no one is always able to maintain stable, non-conflictual relationships. We have the capacity to go to both sides. All of us had experiences of being loved and held as infants. It's clear that if we had not, we would have turned out like those neglected orphans who have trouble functioning in adult life in any way. And we all had times when our caregivers were somewhat neglectful or harsh. So this isn't a situation where whatever we went through as children determines our relationship with reality forever. It's modifiable. So the question then becomes, how do we modify it? And in the course of this series, this class series, I intend to explore that in some depth. To get things started, I'd suggest that one thing we can do is limit our use of news feeds and other media. They always emphasize the harsher, more punitive and distressing aspects of reality, such as war, pollution, economic insecurity, violence, etc. Naturally, if we view a lot of that stuff, reality is going to look rather harsh and punitive, and this is going to affect our relationship with it. So I strongly advocate limiting how much of that we view. What to do in order to build out a sweeter and more organic connection with reality is a little more difficult to state uh, in a couple of sentences. And so that's why we'll be working on it for several class sessions. But the goal will be to feel lovingly connected with reality, much the way a human about to be born uh, feels in the womb with this sweet, uh, very intimate connection with the maternal body. And presumably all placental mammals feel some bond like that, and that all life has a bond like that with the earth one way or another. And it's recapturing the sense of that intimate connection, which is the goal of mindful biology. Well, what is this me that's connected to the earth in either a loving, gentle, organic way or in a harsher, uh, more tenuous one? Clearly, it has a lot to do with this thing we call a brain that fills our skull and that mediates many functions, if not all functions, of what we call mind. So the mind, our conscious mind, looks upon reality from something of a uh, separate position. It's got such a tendency to take a separate stance that it even looks at the body that gives it life as something other and separate. Now, in the course of this class series, we'll question how accurate this sense of separation between mind and body really is. And I'm sure most of the viewers will have practiced yoga or been involved in some other tradition that helps to bring mind and body back into closer alignment. But we'll start by just accepting the mind's separate stance as a given, and then we'll you know, explore ways to question it a little bit later. But if we look at the mind as having a relationship with the body and reality, our task becomes improving that relationship and making it feel more sustaining and nurturing. In this, I'm going to de-emphasize worrying too much about ultimate truths, you know, what's behind it all. And we will use scientific factual information, but we'll use it in a kind of poetic way. Poetry and artistry are really key to helping us develop a warmer, more 
harmonious relationship with our bodies and reality at large. I look at Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman as fine models here. They lived in a time when the U.S. was going through many similar things as it is going through now. There was tremendous political division, even a civil war, which of course did not resolve that division. There was rapid technological change that was altering the way people lived in unprecedented ways. And there was quite a lot of ecological destruction, which bothered uh, people that were sensitive to that. And yet in the midst of all that turmoil and uncertainty, these two poets were able to write profound and beautiful lines. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. And as to me, I know nothing else but miracles. You know, could we br bring this kind of quirky and magical sensibility to our relationship with reality? Could we see the cosmos, the earth, our bodies, one another, and all of life as nothing else but miracles?